Baron Sturmer, the Austrian commissioner, had received from his court a request to conduct a St. Helena and to look after a gardener from Schoenbrunn named Philippe Val, who was instructed by the Emperor of Austria himself to collect all the island could offer in the way of natural history, particularly botany. This man made arrangements to meet Marchand, the Emperor's first valet, and son of the nurse who had tended the King of Rome in Vienna at Jamestown at the behest of Madame Marchand. He brought her son a piece of folded paper on which was written, I send you some of my hair. If you get the opportunity of having yourself painted, send me your portrait. Your mother, Marchand. In the paper, he found a lock of hair, somewhat white and fair. Marchand was not deceived. It belonged to the King of Rome. The Emperor of Austria had forbidden any news to be given Napoleon of his son and had not even instructed his commissioner to St. Helena to testify that the child was living. Marie Louise had not admitted that Napoleon was more concerned with him than herself and had not even thought that she might be able to give news of him. The grandfather and mother did not care. Their allies would have rebuked them for it. What they did not do? An old French woman, a domestic servant, a nurse wanted to do and did it. She got round Booz, the inspector of gardens at Schoenbrunn, and persuaded him to send this envelope containing the hair of well his under gardener. And so by means of this compassionate conspiracy of simple folk, the banished emperor knew at least that his son was alive. Lowe learned that Napoleon had received some hair said to be that of the king of Rome. Who had committed this crime? Doubtless a servant, but who? Probably the French commissioner. Inquiries were begun and cunning questions were put to much. And you, who was furious? No clue here. Next came the Austrian whose wife was French, a Parisian, but it was not the Baroness nor her people. Finally came Val. The governor had already quarreled with Sturmer over this Val. He was suspected. He stayed too long. And he was in communication with the man named Pritz, an Englishman, against whom there was nothing definite, but who had nonetheless been turned out. Low question, Val, who was then simply told what he had done. He could not believe there was anything criminal in having passed onto Marchand a paper containing hair. Sturmer defended him in vain. All that he succeeded in doing was to save Val from the gallows, which would have been his fate if he had undergone trial according to the laws of Great Britain. But he was expelled, and Sturmer, after being recalled with particular severity by Prince Metternich, who, however, shielded him, was cashiered and, for some time at least, disgraced. Who is right in law? Lo, without doubt, he carried out his orders, but in such a manner that, had his story been known, he would have turned an indignant mankind against himself. There is no doubt that this was one of the chief grievances which, upon the word of Napoleon, posterity had against him. It is true that Napoleon had not confined himself to the facts as he received them from Marchand. He took it for granted that Val himself had seen the King of Rome at Schönbrunn, and that Lowe knew it, that Val had requested to come to Longwood, and that Lowe had forbidden him to do so. Nothing is less certain, but he departed from it in a letter which he sent to his causes on December 11th, 1816, and which was ultimately published, he wrote, if you see my wife and son, kiss them for me. For two years, I've had no news of them, either directly or indirectly. For six months, there has been a German botanist in this country who saw them in the garden at Schoenbrunn some months before his departure, but the savages have prevented his coming to bring me news of him them. Five months later, in a document for which he predicted an enormous sensation, he wrote, in the same inquisitional spirit, a botanist from Schoenbrunn, who spent several months on the island and who could have given a father news of his son, was with the greatest care removed from Longwood. The emperor groundlessly presumed that Fell had seen the empress and the king of Rome with less ground still, that he had asked to come to Longwood. But the facts must be faced, and lo, however anxious he may have been, and however incensed his correspondence with Sturmer, 
gradually calmed down, asserting that it was only the clandestine manner in which the lack of hair had been sent he was concerned about. In the case of Val, Lowe had definitely given way, and he had not received any thanks for his condescension, quite the reverse. It was worse still on the second occasion. On May 28, 1817, a store ship, the Bearing under Captain Lamb arrived at St. Helena. On board was a master gunner, Philip Radovich, who was entrusted by the firm of Biagini in London to present Napoleon with a marble bust of his son. It was a commercial bust, the value of which was enhanced by the number of legends attached to it, that it was sculptured from a portrait painted at the best at Leghorn, where the prince was with his mother, that there had been only two models of it that one which the prince's illustrious mother had kept and this one and that no expense had been spared in obtaining a true likeness all of which was untrue on the bust the child was wearing the insignia of the legion of honor whereas it had been taken away from him as soon as he arrived in vienna on the pedestal was inscribed napoleon francois charles joseph as if the name of Napoleon had not been abolished in heaven and on earth, but these mistakes were unintentional, as was that about Leghorn, where the child never went. Still less, his mother, Radovich, fell sick as soon as the bearing entered the roads. Lowe took possession of the bust and deliberated, even asking advice, should he await Lord Bathurst's instructions? Was not this bust a sign of acknowledgement? Did it not continue? contain correspondence it might have done so had it been pilaster but it was of marble this argument seemed so strong that on june 10th after a fortnight's rumination he made up his mind to talk to the grand marshal about the bust but the following day the arrival of the bearing the emperor had known that the bust was on board and he had woven quite a legend around its dispatch the deliberations of low and his adjutant had been reported to him to keep the bust to break it up and throw it into the sea he lay in wait for the governor and from this moment made the affair one of his grievances in his dictations to montalon low declared to the Grand Marshal, that a sculptor of Leghorn had made a bad bust of the son of the Empress Marie Louise and had sent it to St. Helena aboard the Bering. He had not stipulated its price, but he anticipated a hundred louis from the generosity of General Bonaparte. The assumption was so inordinate as to prohibit the acceptance of the bust, since it was obviously a cunning attempt of some bad Tuscan sculptor. To support his statement, Lowe showed Bertrand Biagini's letter and the shipper's memorandum. Those were his doubts. And how could he, in a worse manner, have got out of the affair than by setting the generosity of the emperor at defiance? The Grand Marshal did not allow himself to be imposed upon. He replied that the emperor had a burning desire to see the features of his son again, and he strongly besought the governor to send the bust along the same evening. It is quite true that the emperor considered it priceless. Besides, the delivery would constitute one up on the governor, and he had no doubt that this bust had been made in accordance with instructions from Empress Marie Louise to be offered to the father and the husband as a token of her loving regards. The bust arrived on the 11th. The emperor immediately sent Gorgo to the Grand Marshal's house to open the crate and bring him an account of it. Upon his return, his first words were, What decoration? The eagle? Not that of Saint Etienne? Ah, uh, no, the eagle which your majesty yourself wears. He was satisfied. It sent Gorgo to fetch the bust, whereupon he immediately examined the decorations. Did the empress or the sculptor desire the eagle? He found the child pretty. Although it had a thickish neck, he resembled his mother. He had the Montalon summon. He showed the bust to Amira and the little Balcom girls. Empress Marie Louise had sent it. Did he think that? Did he really imagine that was so? It was said of him. His face shone and expressed in a striking fashion the paternal love and pride which he felt at being the father of such a lovely child. He was obviously delighted with the enthusiastic praise which the Balcombs gave it, but he was almost as satisfied at the thought of the advantage he had gained over the governor. Had not Lowe seriously considered smashing the bust and throwing it into the sea? Had he not retained possession of it for several days? If he had not sent it to me, the emperor said, 
I had decided to lodge a complaint, which would have made the hair of every Englishman stand on end. I would have told things, which would have made every English mother curse him as a monster in human guise. But he had said it, so the remonstrance did not materialize. That was so. But nevertheless, he had wanted to destroy it. Look at it, said the emperor. Look at that face. He must have been, well nigh, a barbarian, an atrocious scoundrel, to have wanted to smash it. I should regard a man capable of doing that or ordering it to be done more wicked than he who poisons another, for the latter has some motive, while the former is only influenced by the blackest heinousness and is capable of any crime. 